any more questions about that paper or hopefully you'll feel much more comfortable. Hopefully you've learned something about yourselves while writing the paper because I wanted you to choose a topic that was going to be interesting to you. You know, yes, I've given two examples of what you can write about to sample topics. Um, but not everyone's interested in gender. Not everyone's interested in sexuality, and that's just not the point of this class. Otherwise, I would have renamed it to as gender and sexuality. Right? So um, hopefully you started diving into other aspects uh, of culture that you really wanted to, to work with um, and see how language interacted with that. So we'll actually kind of see some of this here, because I know a few people had chosen the topic of uh, bilingualism and code switching. So we'll get to see a couple of examples that, um, that a lot of you maybe are not familiar with because you haven't been in a situation where there was that sort of intense language contact going on. So where the class <coughs> left off, on Thursday's lecture, we were just wrapping up everything about pigeons and creoles, right? Now mind you, pigeons and creoles are only one way um, or one of the sort of possible outcomes that could occur when you get different groups of people who speak different languages to interact with each other. Right? And part of the, the outcomes are sort of governed by how intense the interaction is. Um, and also another part of the, the um, outcome is dependent on the sort of power differences you see amongst the speakers or the different speakers there. So back during colonialization time, um, when the English were sailing in their ships and they went out and you know sort of visited other lands, they basically displaced a lot of languages because English was sort of in this prestigious situation. They were in a more dominant position, right? And so, um, but sometimes the, the power differences worked out a little bit, you know, differently than just forcing everything out. Sometimes you can get languages to sort of peacefully coexist. And this is where um, we'll see bilingualism begin to come in. But let's look at briefly, just very, very briefly, another type of outcome that a lot of people are going to be very, very familiar with because we speak this language here. And this is borrowing, right? So you can have some mild type of contact where, because it's like, where um, you could basically just need to pilfer words from a language. And notice I'm saying pilfering because we actually don't borrow, we steal them from another language. We don't give it back. It's not like I go up to Italian and say, I need the word spaghetti, I'll take it into my language, I'll give it back to you in a couple of hundred years. That doesn't happen. It just becomes an integral part of, of the English language. So um, yeah, the, the term um, borrowing is somewhat of a misnomer, right? Um, we don't give it back to that language. So one language may borrow or actually incorporate words from another language. And English is really good at this. And the borrowing lets us know, well, what sort of different communities have we contacted throughout our history, you know, history of being English speakers. And we can do this by just simply going through a dictionary, just finding all the non-English words, right? And it's kind of tough to say what is an English word because a lot of you would agree kangaroo is an English word, but it originally came from some Australian Aboriginal language. Um, and you know, we can just go through a dictionary and just sort of classify these words, which ones were introduced by this sort of not so intense you know, um, cultural contact. So lots of different languages um, are represented up here. So in Australian, um, and, and notice I'm being very gross here in the sense that I'm just not being fine detail. Um, I'm not giving you fine details as to which specific Aboriginal language here um, is contributing to these words. But it, it was an Australian Aboriginal language. So we get words like kangaroo, um, wombat, boomerang. Um, how many of you just felt that those were not even English words, that they belonged to someone else? You. Yeah, and it's probably you felt like that because you probably know something about Australian, you know, uh, culture or maybe even Aboriginal, you know, Aboriginal <laughs> society, right? Um, African languages, 
I had to, I had to put this one here because this is a phenomenon that I just got introduced to in Kansas. Um, so banjo, right? Um, that's a, that's from a Bantu language. Um, so the instrument, um, chiggers, the the little weird things that eat up your leg. You can't see them, but they eat up your leg. Um, jazz, that comes from an African, you know, an African language. Zombie. Um, these are just small selections of. The list goes on and on and on. Um, Arabic. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but Arabic highly influenced English. Um, especially if you start getting into the maths or mathematics, right? There's lots of Arabic words in mathematics. So um, there's a little sample here. Albatross, um, algebra, apricot, cotton, syrup, uh, sherbet, sorbet, all of Arabic um, um, origin. As a matter of fact, anytime you see a word that has al like that in front, that's the definitive article or the definite article. <coughs> Um, the, basically, in Arabic. It just didn't register to us when we were borrowing these words that they had the in there. So when you take a word like alligator, which means the lizard, right? Um, Al there is the, the definite you know, article, and agator will be the, uh, the lizard part, right? Agator. Um, Hindi and Sanskrit donated lots of words to the English language, so avatar, that's a, you know, not just the blue creatures that run around on this mysterious planet, right? Um, you know, um, cots and um, guru, yeah, jungle, pajamas, shampoo, all of Hindi words. But again, we don't think twice about it as being Hindi. We just think, oh, they're English. Um, Manga, tycoon, soy, sodoku, sodoku, sodoku. I don't play the game very often. Once you do one puzzle, they all become the same. So, um, yeah, those are all from Japanese. And then lots of Native Americans. Again, I'm being gross about this. I'm not saying whether it's a particular Athabascan language or Algonquian language or, or Plains language or whatever. Um, grossly saying Native American, but words like caribou and hickory and moose and pecan and woodchuck. And you always get that question, at least for me, say, well, why is it that goose are geese in the plural, but moose isn't meese in the plural? And it's because, well, goose and geese are Germanic words. It's always been in the English language. Moose hasn't. That's something relatively new. Um, and it was from Native American languages, which don't make plurals that way. Right? So that's your explanation for some of the lexical exceptions that we see with our, with our language. If it doesn't fit the normal pattern, there's a very good reason why it doesn't fit the normal pattern. Usually, you can look at things like borrowings as, as an indicator of that. So this is one other phenomenon that can happen you know, with sort of minimal contact with language. But let's look at when languages sort of begin to coexist in a sort of space with each other. And that leads us to pluralism. So um, pluralism, just multiple languages sharing the same sort of geographic region. Um, and usually the speakers within that geographic region will demonstrate some competency in these different languages that are spoken there. And so, for the most part, we tend to just focus on bilingualism, the use of two languages within a sort of, you know, given area or region. Um, and that's the normal state of affairs for individuals, because in time, um, is to know two languages, pretty much. But you do get other people who know many, many, many more. Right. Um, and so we just refer to all of this as multilingualism. So several languages. Now, a lot of people are like, well, geez, how does multilingualism happen? Um, usually it's because that, you know, some of the languages that are spoken in such close quarters, they begin to look similar after a while, but they're still distinct languages. So that gives people a jumping point in knowing or learning how to speak the other languages. They're not completely starting from scratch. But there are cases of people who are like trilingual, 
and all three languages are from a completely different, you know, um, different language family. Um, it's rarer, um, but you can't find it. Now, why is it that anthropologists and linguists are interested in this notion of, of bilingualism? Well, first of all, it challenges this sort of old idea of the nation, whatever this thing we call a nation, um, is a desirable unit that is culturally <coughs> and linguistically homogenous. So for example, America has always been sort of held up as an example of redefining what a nation is. Because, I mean, we focus on this thing that culturally we are a melting pot. Isn't that the phrase that we always hear? America is the melting pot. Um, and we celebrate linguistic diversity because, well, we don't have things like a national language. That's what we say about ourselves, but what we practice is something completely different, right? But still, bilingualism is a great place to, to challenge this idea of what it means to be a nation. So here's a couple of, a couple of instances of this. Um, um, so if we go to France, right? Um, there really isn't just one French language. Um, there are many different varieties of things will classify as French. So for example, you can go to one region, like Breton, and I, I wouldn't even say, you know, Breton is really, you know, French. It's, it's, it's Gaelic, actually. It's, you know, Gaelic language. But, you know, um, there are some French varieties spoken in that area, too. Gascon, Pied, Occitan, all very different varieties all spoken in this sort of region that we sort of classify as France. And, and mind you, the borders of France that we know it as today is not the same borders as it was a couple of hundred years ago. Borders always shift. So there's one part of France, um, this Alsace region, that technically was Germany at one time. And when you go there and listen to them, um, Maybe about a little less than 100 years ago, I know some of my colleagues whose grandparents were actually speaking um, Germanic dialects in that area of France. Uh, but now they speak, you know, um, some French variety. So there are these many varieties um, that are sort of, you know, spoken in all over all over this nation state we'll call France, and they are still today. However, um, after much debate, there was this promotion of this, we've got to have this one common language so that we can unite everyone from Breton to Gascon to Occitan to Alsace to just be who we are, which are this identity of being French. Right? And there's this motto that they have, this, you know, liberté, égalité, et fraternité, right? Which is sort of, you know, liberty, equality, and sort of brotherhood. They all wanted to band themselves together. Um, and so this standard French, you know, or something that's like closer to maybe the Parisian standard, the standard French was institutionalized. Um, it was taught through the education system. It was promoted by the, by the military just to get all these different varieties to band under one common identity. Um, there's a, an organization in France that basically dictates what is the French language. You, I mean, many of you are probably unfamiliar with this because we don't have this in the United States. We don't have like an ivory tower of scholars that says this is the way the English language must be spoken. But countries like France have, has it. Um, Spain has it. The United Kingdom ha actually has it too. Lots of places have this sort of organization that does this language maintenance uh, thing. And so, um, <coughs> When you say standard French, the things that you're learning in your textbooks, it'll help you to watch the news. It'll help you to read the newspaper. It may help you to do some interaction in Paris. But I guarantee you, once you step away from those major centers and go out to the country, you're not going to understand very much. Um, how many of you um, are learning Italian right now? No? OK, well, Italian is the same thing, too. 
you know, you learn a very specific dialect of Italian, but then you go off to Italy and want to go to, say, you know, Milan or something, and they speak Milano, and you're like, whoa, what the heck is going on? I don't understand one thing. Spanish, right? What variety of Spanish are you learning right now in your Spanish classes? Well, okay, I heard Spain, but guess what? There are a multitude of Spain Spaniards. Yeah, um, Castilian, right? You know, typically. Uh, but then you step away from that region, and you're going to get something that sounds, you know, the farther north you go, you get something that sounds much more like French when you head towards the Pyrenees. If you go over along the Mediterranean coast and skirt the southern part of France, you're going to get stuff that sounds much more like Italian. So um, when you're trying to develop, you know, a, a nation state, it, you know, the, the claim is that it helps if everyone can communicate with each other, and in order to do that, you have to have a standard. Right? Um, the cultural aspect it gets even messier. Right? What does it really mean to be French? What does it really mean to be Italian? What does it even mean to be American? I can right now poll all 100 and something of you all and ask you, what does it mean to be American? I guarantee I'll get just about 100 different answers for this. What do you call that one on camera? Yeah. All right, so bilingualism as a test for linguistic theory. So for a long time, bilingualism has sort of just been, you know, extra to the corners of linguistic studies. Um, it's only very recently that people are now interested in this, in particular for things like, well, learning how to develop better second language learning programs. Um, how do we create better curriculum for learning a different language? So um, now there are many linguists who actually just focus on things like second language acquisition or, or bilingual. And um, they are interested in just sort of accounting for the different types of bilingual forms and practices we see. So when you're bilingual, it's not that you just know two languages equally. You will use those two languages very differently. They will appear in different contexts. It's sort of like being bidialectal. Remember, most of us have multiple dialects. So for example, if you're from a person, Speaking like you're from McPherson will get you far in certain situations, but speaking McPherson <coughs> in a context that, you know, say maybe like an institute or something may not help you at all. So there's always an appropriate time and an appropriate place for these different, you know, varieties. Um, one of the things that we're interested in in bilingualism, sort of understanding when one language is produced and when another language is produced, is this notion of code switching which is this concurrent use of multiple languages within a conversation. And so you get this sort of switching back and forth between languages. Now, a lot of people think when they hear, you know, um, Spanish speakers that are here locally um, speaking Spanish, and then all of a sudden they hear English, and then they hear Spanish again, and then maybe an English word and then more Spanish, um, a lot of people think that those sort of happen half, you know, haphazardly. But there are actual rules, or there are other explanations to you know, sort of explain what's going on with this switching. So on the one hand, we could take something as very basic, you know, like, well, maybe there's a competency issue. If I don't know the word or, or a word for something in the language that I'm currently speaking, I'll probably revert to another language that I have you know, access to and pull that word in. That's one explanation, so competency can come in. Uh, context could make a big deal. So, for example, um, you know, let's say that my mom um, is here. You know, we'll just construct my mom as being here. She doesn't speak German. But if I'm having a conversation with some German people, um, if I want to integrate my mom into the conversation, maybe I should switch back into to English or some other language that we share, right? So you can switch languages to bring people into a conversation. You can do the reverse. You can switch languages to exclude certain people from the conversation, too. So 
there are some social motivations for doing that. Right? Um, sometimes it could be things like, well, I speak Spanish at home, but when I'm at university, I speak English. The setting could be really important. So um, even if I'm at home, if I need to talk about something that was going on at the university, I might just so happen to switch into English just because maybe the interaction did occur in English. So yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff here. Um, so here's a good example of, um, of code switching. And I'll show you that there's, again, like I say, there's some regular rules to this. So you can sort of figure out why the code switching occurred. Um, so again, some of it could be people related, topic related, you know, there's some aspect of context. Maybe I don't know the word. But some of it is actually linguistic structure that linguistic structure motivates the, the code switching. So for example, here's a, a, a German um, English example. So the English is bolded, if you don't realize that, because um, I'm going to show you a couple examples in which German and English look exactly alike. All right. um, so here I have the phrase, somebody sa um, has said that he is the father of her child. And so the first part will be in German. Um, <coughs> and then you get the English part. The question is, well, why is it that this person, you know, had just switched from German into English? Well, could it be something about the context? Fortunately, I don't know because I don't have the full context of this situation. Uh, but could it be something structural? And that's probably what's going on. When you're switching from one language to another, usually you got to do it at some type of boundary, some type of linguistic boundary. Whether it's a clause, that means that you can switch from one sentence to the next. You know, when you one lang one sentence will be in one language, the next sentence will be in a different language because you have a clause boundary to separate that. Or it could be a phrasal boundary. So maybe a particular phrase. I mean, you know, whatever that you know, syntactic phrase is, could be in a different language. Now, how many of you have had 106 before? Okay, so a few of you might be able to figure this out. Um, is there a phrasal boundary in this language in which, well, at least this um, situation here, um, German English, in which the code switching is occurring? What is that? Yeah. Noun phrase, exactly. The noun phrases in English here. <coughs> so I have all of this stuff that you know is preceding the noun phrase, and it's funny because yeah, I have a verb phrase here, you know, um, that's sort of like an embedded clause. Someone says, and then you have this embedded clause. You have a verb phrase within the embedded clause, and then you get the noun phrase. But the noun phrase part is um, in English. It's not like you'll probably get. Um, there is there, and then you get father. You know, it might be a little weird, you know, to to make a switch after, you know, before father, where this will be German der, right? Um, so yeah, there are some structural rules that govern code switching too. So it's not haphazard. Now, if it is haphazard, then we call that something like code mixing. Right? So the rules are a little less you know, strict, and it makes it a little bit more difficult to pinpoint what's motivating the actual switching. Let me give you a good example of this from um, an advert. Sorry, it's in black and white. I couldn't find the color version of it, um, but it was in most newspapers for a while. In the, uh, it's, did we even have this in the United States, the Mac croissant? Uh, this was a big McDonald's campaign in, um, in Germany for a while. Um, so it's the American answer to the croissant. Okay. Um, what is it? Well, we didn't eat it here. Yeah. I don't think. That's the funny thing. I don't know why they're attributing it to us, but that, that's hilarious. And notice, even the, the, the byline, you know, the American answer to al croissant, we've got some code switching going on. Know, going um, you know, they, uh, American is not the word that you would use here um, in, in German. You know, 
know, it would be like, I don't know, in this case here, probably a very or something, you know, of that nature. Um, but then you get B, right? That's not a German word. You know, it would probably be B in this case. So, um, yeah, um, you get code switching um, from there, or at least the switching of language from the American to Antwort, um, in this case here. Let's go farther into the ad. Let's pick these little sections here. And notice, it, it's great. So they show this nebulous facade, and they're diagramming it. They're telling you the beauty of this, this facade here. They're, they're going to indicate all the cool points. So here's the first one. So um, the Lekka Warm, I don't even know if warm, it, is it Warm or Warm Facade um, Geschnitten in two Teile. Okay, so here we go. We're, we're getting some weirdness going on here. Lekka um, is the German word for delicious. So the delicious warm facade um, Geschnitten in two Teile. So Teile pieces. Okay. So it's in two pieces. Geschnitten is to sort of, you know, like, you know, cut. Right? Um, this is very practical. Um, you know, practical. It, it, it's very practical. Um, I guess that's so or so. I don't know. So is um, genug Platz um, for weiter lecker things. Um, so it's enough room um, for further delicious things. I don't know what the further delicious things are or what the enough room is, but um, it's strange because a lot of you know a lot of us. How many of you are, are German readers or speakers? Most of us are a little bit. It, a lot of you are probably like it's a little bit difficult to figure out where the German begins and the English you know sort of ends because of course we're both Germanic languages and some of our forms look exactly alike. You know, like. Um, but yeah, here we get M2. That's that's a little strange, you know. There's some English, you know, switching there going on. All right. Well, let's see the second part. That's selling point one. <coughs> so the first lacquer thing, um, the queso. So the first delicious thing, the cheese. All right. Um, um, a little bit ungeschmolzen, and this is a very big theme for the Schinken. So a little bit is melted, and this is comfortable for the ham. <laughs> I know when I'm like cold during winter nights, I don't think of melted cheese to make myself comfortable or anything, but there you go. Um, so it, it, it's comfortable for the ham. Um, he cannot fall out of the facade. And this is kind of funny. Um, you know, um, here, he cannot fall out of the croissant. Um, <laughs> what cannot fall out of the croissant? The ham. Um, so, obviously, of course in English we call ham it, right? You know, it's, I'm not interested in the gender of the, of the meat that I'm about to eat, right? So, um, but I think that's a holdover from German, where you probably have to link masculinity, you know, for, uh, for, for ham there. So, you get a little weirdness going on with even their understanding of code switching, right? So, German grammatical rule plays a role in, you know, how they actually use English. It's sort of a little interference pattern. All right, here's another selling point. Um, the second lecker of the, um, the Schinken. Um, and so it goes on to saying, you know, saftig and praktische, you know, stripes of geschnitten. So it's juicy and cut in practical strips. <coughs> I think the Germans are all about practicality or something. That's just the big thing here. Uh, I, you know what? It probably is. <laughs> now I think about it. Um, I don't know, but I just never experienced it. That's the problem. So I, I, I wish I had had the opportunity to talk about it. But um, there's so many other delicious things to eat in Germany for breakfast. 
like, you know, fleisch, you know, salad for breakfast. It's a meat salad with this cream and mayo that you add onto toast. That's better, you know. I wouldn't have thought of going to McDonald's you know, for breakfast there. But um, it's interesting. Um, and so, you know, here we get this, this in here. Question is, is it English or is it German? That makes it difficult. Makes it makes it really difficult. So sometimes, um, sometimes you can um, sort of like have transition points where two languages look similar to each other, and that similarity allows you to access the other language, um, you know, pretty you know seamlessly. Um, sometimes if the languages share grammatical features, like grammatical structure. And you can easily map on one structure, you know, or flow from one structure into a different language without a problem. Right? So, so as long as the roadmap is the same, you can kind of get to, you know, the different points where you need to. Um, you don't have to change the map. So this is um, code switching, and that's probably as far as I'll go into it um, for right now in class. But I just wanted to let you know that there are, it, it's not really haphazard. There are some motivations for this, um, this sort of thing. Um, and this is very common around the world. So when we look at things like um, in Southern California, yes, we do have Spanglish that goes on, but then there are other people who probably know English and Spanish as completely separate languages, but will use them functionally in the world for different things. Um, and so, um, yeah, how many of you have had experiences like that, actually, where you've had to switch into a different language to accomplish something? Yeah, what was your case for? Um, so, I'm from an American family, but I grew up in France. Uh -huh. So, which is the language of the street was French, which is what we speak to get business time. And so, and, and France sometimes presents some really interesting situations where, say, like the closer, um, well, actually, it's more Belgium. Belgium would do this sort of thing. Where, yeah, and so um, where you can go into a bank, and for some odd reason, you know, um, some local varieties are not expected to be spoken at a bank. You, you know, you'd have to speak a more, you know, nationally recognized variety like either standard French or even sometimes Dutch. You know, at times. But yeah. Yeah, I am. Um I spent most of my early childhood in the north of France near Belgium and then my adolescence in the west mm -hmm. in the like Loire Valley and it's very extremely different French and so sometimes I'd ask for things that just don't exist in that part. <laughs> and I'd get laughed at and people thought it was very weird. And then I just changed. Yeah, exactly. You just learn to, you know and that's the thing about culture clashes. We learn to, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, we're not just stuck in one culture, right? You know, yes, we can say we're American or, or something of that nature, but um, <coughs> when you interact with people who have different practices. Um, there are going to be things that are just not congruent with what you know, right? And you adapt. You slowly change. You're not locked into this this one system. Um, but with this. You know, these problems help us to know that there are these differences. Um, without having these problems, you wouldn't realize that the French in the north are doing something completely different than the French in, in the west. Um, so when you see a problem like that, it makes you think, oh, well, that's a little bit different. Um, let me figure out what's going on here. And then you reshape your own cultural models. Um, same thing linguistically, too. Um, our languages shape depending on what region we you know, move to or are, are from. So just because you're from McPherson, Kansas, doesn't mean you're always locked in into speaking exactly like someone from McPherson, Kansas. Um, and I know many of you have had this experience where your parents are probably are from a different area of the United States. And when you go home to visit grandparents, all of a sudden your parents' dialects begin to change. Sounds funny. So yes, when I do go back to Texas to, to see my mom and dad, um, some aspect of Texanness, I guess, comes out. I don't know how to quite explain it, but I will do. I do say y'all at times. Um, 
because that's what they do in Texas. Uh, but then once I'm out of Texas, then if I'm back in an academic setting, I go back to something a little bit more standard. You know, not regional marks um, as at all. All right, so that's code switching, and I look forward to seeing what some people have come up with code switching. Maybe you found something similar you know, to these sorts of things. Um, so let's move into one more topic um, that we're sort of interested in in, in linguistic anthropology. Is this, you know, well, languages change, guys. Right? It changes because of contact with other cultures and other speakers. But then also, there's just this natural thing that all things change. Sort of like evolution. You know, yes, we're all homo sapiens, but there are minute changes that are going on within us that may get passed on to the next generation or may not. But after a while, this cumulative, you know, um, effect of all the changes will sort of dictate how the species, you know, evolves later on, right? So we're going to look at historical linguistics. And historical linguistics is just basically the study of how languages change over time. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as diachronic linguistics, so languages throughout time. Whereas, for the most part, what we've been looking at in this class have been language from one particular point in time. So we call that synchronic linguistics. Um, and that point in time could be in the past, but for the most part, we've been looking at language as it is, you know, currently, so in the present. So it's just different, you know, different ways of viewing language um, as it progresses over time or just looking at it at one point in, on the timeline. So let me give you some examples um, of how language could change. And it doesn't just affect, you know, sounds, as most people will typically think, or um, it doesn't just affect meaning that a lot of people will have access to, but all structures of a language can undergo some sort of change. So for example, we could do sound change, where in English, the old English word knick um, is our modern word for night. So we lost this initial, you know, what we'll call a voiceless, you know, velar stop, this cut sound, when it preceded, you know, um, a nasal. So we don't have a, you know, cluster in English any longer. It's a perfectly, you know, it's a perfectly Germanic consonant cluster, but um, we just lost that. And then also the vowel in the middle has changed from me, you know, e to i. Right? And that's sort of a, a fallout from the late 1400s, early 1500s of the great English vowel shift, right? Where it took a couple hundred years for all the vowels to move around, you know, um, in the vowel space. So e, what was historically an e sound, became an I sound in, in modern English. So sounds can change. That explains a lot of our goofy orthography, right? That our orthography preserves, you know, things from Middle English and Early Modern English. And we never bothered to change our orthographic system, the way we write things. And so that's why students have a hard time with these silent letters, you know, um, you know, like the silent E's that we get at the end of words? Um, those were actually pronounced at one time. There were schwa in Middle English time, but there was a vowel there. And that schwa got deleted, you know, um, as, you know, English moved forward. So sound changes. Uh, morphology, the little bits that you add to build a word, so prefixes and suffixes, um, they change over time. So historically, the um, plural for the word brother was brethren. That is the historical plural for that word. Now, we still actually have that in, in English, but in very limited context. Where would you hear the word brethren, typically? Yeah, in church, right? And so, um, because, you know, in you know, sort of church-like language, you kind of want to maintain some type of tradition, right? 
you know. Um, and so you find lots of traditional language in you know sort of these religious practices. It doesn't you know necessarily progress like language outside of the church setting. As a matter of fact, I know maybe what was it? Uh, maybe five or six years ago, the Catholic Church has basically said it's okay to teach now everything completely in vernacular. We're going to update the mass. And so if many of you are Catholic, you probably remember about that time where the Catholic mass has changed, where some of the words that you have memorized are completely different now. Did anyone experience that? You know, being a Catholic? Yeah. It was, it was a little jolting when I, when I read it, you know. Um, I was like, wow, it doesn't sound very religious any longer. Um, it sounds just like modern English now. Uh, loss of gender distinctions in, in English. We used to have gendered nouns, where you classify nouns as masculine, feminine, and neuter. Because after all, we're a Germanic language. And Germanic languages do this. But um, we don't see that any longer. Um, the definite article in English is the, all the way across. The man, the woman, the book. Whereas in, you know, um, in German, you know, it, it's, you know, der, das, and die. So day would be the masculine, das would be the neuter, and D would be the feminine. And you had to know, you know, the map that you had to know the gender of the word in order to produce the correct article for that word. And that's where a lot of people who are learning, you know, German for the first time have that problem. It's like, geez, now I've got to memorize all this. Spanish, you kind of have a little cue, right, to work for us, to figure out something is masculine or feminine. And it's usually that last problem <coughs> on the nail. If it's an O, you can assume it to be masculine. If it's A, you can assume it to be feminine. And then you get the Greek words to totally add to the confusion in Spanish. So all Greek words in Spanish that end in A are really masculine, like the word mapa. Um, you get syntactic change in languages. So the typical... Um, German word order for adverbial clauses um, was a, you know, um, SOV. You get the subject first, then the object, and then you get the verb at the end. English doesn't like that. No, we're, we, we like our SVO word ordering, you know, all the way through. Uh, so yeah, our, our syntax could change. Semantics could change. So, for example, let's take Latin to Spanish. Um, you have the Latin hoc hora, which means at this hour, like at this you know, um, particular time, underdo, you know, undergoes some type of hand waving to cause the sounds to change a little bit. You know, like, you know, delete a couple of H's, delete the K here, and then you get ahora, which now means now in Spanish. So um, you can get slight shifts of, of meaning. Um, here's a good example of this um, in, in English. They, it's really fun to do this with dirty words, right? So um, the word hussy. Okay, how many of you know the word hussy? I think it's fallen out, right? But hussy. What is the contemporary definition of hussy? Part of the factor being recorded. <laughs> Slutty. Slutty. Oh, that's a good one. I like that word too. Um, we're going to talk about that one. Um, so, I guess we'll. it would have been hoos. And the E part, well, there was some phonological attrition that had happened. And it was from the word wife. Or in Old English, we. Who's we? Slowly change and becomes hussy. So historically, a hussy was a housewife. But you got to understand what kind of happened in societies that housewives were kind of rural situations, you know? And for some odd reason, rural girls <laughs> <laughs> <Same>. <laughs> you 
just saying. Um, but um, slutty was also like that too, in a certain way where it just meant unkempt, you know, um, to not be tight. Um, and then all of a sudden it took on this negative, you know, sort of. Uh, there you go. And then you can get pragmatic change. Um, in the sense that, say like in Mandarin Chinese, you have um, this form, yige, here meaning one, um, like the number one, right? But after a while, whenever you put like one book, one person, one paper, it begins to take on a different meaning, like, well, if it's one book, I guess it's a book. If it's one person, I guess it's a person. It's, you know, one paper, it's a paper. So now you go from meaning the number one to just being this indefinite article. All right, let me give you a couple more changes before we go. Um, here's some other things that are happening right now. You can change this in, in live, you know, in, in real time. And you can go out and test this. So the quotative said, right? She said X. See, that's the standard quoted. However, it's in competition right now with things like she went wow. Or she's like wow. Or she's all like wow. Or she's all wow. Or, you know, it, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> but how many of you, I mean, we're familiar with this, right? We've seen it. And it's all doing the same thing. It's <coughs> quoted. It's quoting someone. And I don't know, maybe something is going to win. I think like is the, the likely one to win, because I hear that very frequently. I used to hear it in California, and I'm amazed at how frequent I hear it here, too. Uh, I thought it was a California thing, initially. In areas like Pennsylvania, you can do this funny thing called double modals. Usually when you're, when you're, when you're speaking, you can only have a modal followed by a vowel can't have two modals together. Um, but in Pennsylvania, you could say, I might could do something. Sounds different, right? Um, but British English does the same thing, too. Um, and it's, very, it's a very recent phenomenon of you know, that happening. In the US and Canada, the word pen, like this, is becoming homophonous. It is sounding exactly like the word pen in most places. And I've heard this before. I was at Checkers once. And I was behind a lady who, you know, had a million things and then she decided to pay with a check. I was like, who pays with a check these days? <laughs> and so she pulls out of her checkbook and then she asked the cashier, does she have a pin? And of course I figured out, well, okay, yes, she's asking for a writing instrument because she's pulled out the checkbook. She's not asking for a stick pin or anything. But that nasal raising is occurring all throughout Canada and the US. So eventually these two words are going to sound exactly like the same. Um, the word rave used to be like, yay, you know, enthusiasm. But that's not the rave I grew up in. The rave I grew up in is where we were all like in mosh pits, you know, getting all crazy and dancing to like, <laughs> That's the rave I know. And then you get new words. We always make new words. Okay, email isn't terribly new. Going postal isn't new. But, um, I don't know. What other new words do we have? Selfie. Selfie. Selfie is completely new. That's right. Absolutely. All right. See you all on Thursday.
Yeah, not a big deal. Not a big deal. Okay.